Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last of today's webinars, which is on one of our favourite topics, data privacy and the GDPR. Delighted to be joined again by Andy, uh, Andy Stiles and Anna Walters, who uh, are two of our senior DPOs here at Risk Evolves, and I'll take you through some of the data privacy basics. Um, before I go on, just to let you all know that this session is being recorded and it will be available as well on playback, either on our YouTube channel or indeed uh, and there's a link on the website at the beginning of next week. Um, within the GoToWebinar control panel, you do have the opportunity to raise questions. Please do that. The more questions, the merrier, because I'd like to quiz these two on their knowledge of GDPR. Um, and if you just have any, any chat issues or if you've got some problems, uh, some technical issues, then, then just pop those in as well and we'll see whether Dean can help anybody who's struggling to get the go to webinar to work. Um, finally, as we close the session, you'll also receive a short, emphasis on the word short, questionnaire on how you felt the session's gone today, uh, any feedback, please feel feel free to leave any feedback, good, bad or otherwise. Uh, and if there's anything you'd like to see in the future, then also please put that into the feedback chart as well. So just a reminder of who we are and what we do. Risk Evolves is a, whoops, a daisy, pressed one too many then. Uh, risk Evolves is a governance risk and compliance consultancy company. We are, we do get a bit geeky guys, don't we, about anything to do with risk and compliance. We focus on all sorts of different things as outlined there, one of which is data privacy. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Anna to take us through the principles of the GDPR and hopefully this is going to start displaying. There we go. Oh, brilliant. Oh, so you're, oh, you're driving for me. So I'm, I'm no, out of control see, here. <laughs> Dean's done all of these, you see, and I just feel that we should show them in their true glory now, rather than when you and I do PowerPoint slides. So go for brilliant. it. Principles of the okay. GDPR. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing I will say is thank you for joining the graveyard shift. Um, I don't know, Andy, do you get this feeling that as data privacy people, we're putting the graveyard shift every every webinar day? I think we are. You are consistently. We've gone back through seven series of webinars and you are always the last session always, of the day. Always the last session of the day. So for those of you who are joining us at the last session of the day, um, hi and welcome. Um, so Helen, thank you for uh, giving me the, the, the first bit, which is talking about the principles of the GDPR. So. I'm, I'm really conscious that we're we're over four years into GDPR now, and, and one of the things that Helen and, and Andy and I chatted about was that it can often kind of get lost about actually where did we start? Where what is the basics of GDPR? Everyone's getting really kind of excited about data transfers and all those other kind of things, but we we often don't talk about the basics enough. So that's what we're going to do today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is fundamentally the principles of the GDPR. What does the GDPR expect of us all? And it's one of the reasons why I like the GDPR, because it actually gives us, um, it tells us exactly what it wants us to do. What it doesn't do is tell us how we get to decide that. So, you know, the first principle that, that um, the GDPR asks of us all is to make sure we're being fair, lawful and transparent. Now, this one always gets me because I'm like, it's not a principle, it's three principles all in one. Um, and what does and what does fair mean as well? So. Fair is, and I, and I often kind of think this is really difficult to explain. Fairness doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as it would mean to to me or to Andy or to Helen. So fairness is is, is very much one of those things that kind of it, it, you know has a bit of a sliding scale. Um, but we all have a really good sense, an innate sense of actually what is fair. And the way I describe it to people is um, if you kind of want to do something with someone's data and it makes you think, oh, I'm not sure. Ooh. Um, then that's probably your fairness threshold kicking in and thinking, oh, I'm not sure whether I should do that. So it's always a really difficult one to, to put your finger on. But as long as you're being fair, being lawful, um, that's, you know, that, that's quite a simple one. Um, you know, it, it's actually following the law. Being transparent is, is actually being honest about what you do. Um, and a lot of the ways that, that you might do that as a business is by um, the use of your privacy policy. Um, and transparency is also about not just what you say about what you do, but how you say it. So, you know, using some really simple and clear language in your policies and how you communicate with people about the use of their data. So that's the first bubble, fair, lawful and transparent. Um, the second one is something called limited purpose. What does that mean? So the law gives us um, a number of reasons that we can do things with people's data, and that's called your lawful purpose. And basically what this principle means is that as long as you stick to that purpose, you choose your purpose at the outset, stick to it, then you're in a good place. 
Next one, data minimization. Um, this is really simple. Only collect the data that you need. You know, if you don't need people's shoe size, then don't ask for it. Um, you know, don't, and, 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 you know, top tip here as well. It's really easy when, when we're all kind of busy and working and thinking about those projects, you know, in, in the future is thinking, oh, well, in the future, we might need this. No, you don't need it right now. So only, only collect the data you need for the job that you're doing. If you think you might need it at a later point in time, then that's when you start collecting it. Don't necessarily start hoarding data that you don't need and you can't therefore justify. Helen, you're nodding away there. Andy, you're no, nodding no, no, away. No, no, no I, I am, I'm nodding away because the data minimization thing is key, isn't it? We don't hoard to, data. Don't hoard it. Absolutely don't hoard it. Um, the next you, one, accurate. Yeah. Oh, go on, Andy. I say when you don't need it, get rid of it, because what I still come across even now is four years in people that had data that they should have cleared or minimised in the, on the 25th of May 2018. And they still got it and they're thinking, well, we're failing this basic principle straight away. But. Yeah. And, it, it, and, you know, it, it's, it's important if you're thinking of the well, just in case just in case scenario, then, you know, we, we, there might need to be some work done on there, done there on a little bit of data minimisation. Um, Accuracy. This is a really simple one. Keep it correct. And actually, why would you have data if it's not correct? It's not useful to you as a business. It does, it's not meaningful anymore. And, and you obviously don't necessarily need it as well. If it, you know, so make sure that you're keeping it correct. Um, retention. I've already mentioned this really in, in under data minimization. This is all about making sure that you don't save data for any longer than you need it. If you don't need it anymore, then you do have an obligation to make sure that, that, that you do that you do um, uh, erase that. Um, and then the next one is security. Keep it safe, people. So if you've got data, if if people are trusting you with their data, then you do have that obligation to keep it safe. How you keep it safe is it you know is your decision now this is one of those things that a lot of people i a lot of my clients kind of get a bit like oh my gosh you know what what are the really technical things i need to do i bet a lot of organizations are already doing some of those things so you know it's it's simple things like you know having your username and password to get in having multi-factor authentication to uh, for, for access to your main accounts you know if you've got paper it's locked away in a cupboard so you're probably already doing some of these things without realizing that actually you're following a principle of the GDPR, which is security. Um, and then the final principle that we have um, is something called accountability. Now, accountability is basically being responsible for what you do, being able to demonstrate that you're doing all of those previous six principles and actually being able to, so you document what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it, and being able to demonstrate that should anybody ask, whether that be a regulator, whether that be a, um, a, a, a supplier or a client, you know, you need to be able to be accountable for, for what you're doing and demonstrating the what and the why. Brilliant. And of course, the accountability was really um, brought in as a formally, but it's always been there, hasn't it, under the EU GDPR, but the UK formalised it as a principle as part of the UK GDPR. So this is still very much applicable, even though we're no longer part of the EU. <clears throat> so if those are our principles, Andy, what about the lingo? So we started out this morning talking about no jargon and, and hey, the whole data protection world has got its own jargon, hasn't it? So what on earth is a data subject, a data controller, a data processor, a sub-processor? I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you turn around and, and say that- personal information as well? What's, let's just go right back to basics as well. What is personal information? We keep things simple and, I, and I, I, I like this diagram because it really simplifies everything we're talking about. So everything Anna's has spoken about is the principle. So once we've got data, what are we meant to do with it? We're meant to be we're transparent about what we're doing it, we do it fairly, we use the lawful basis, it's minimised. But how does that all come together? So, so, so I, I said I really like this diagram. So starting on the left, you've got a data subject. That's you and I. It, and when we give our information to an organisation, GDPR principles then kick into play. So those seven principles then kick into play. So who do we give our data to? We give our data to a data controller. We give it to a business and that is the data controller. And it's the data controller's responsibility to make sure they tick all those seven boxes around the principles. I, are we treating this fairly? Are we being transparent in what we're doing? So why do we do that? Because GDPR stipulates that we've got a legal obligation as a data controller, as an organisation, 
organization that when a data subject gives us their information that we meet all those requirements we are we are legally obliged to say to that data subject we're doing all of this so therefore it's really important that, that as the data controller the person that takes that information and then can decide what happens with it um, have, have, have met all those requirements. If they don't, then that data controller is failing its obligations to the people, and more importantly, is going to fall foul of the legislation. Um, and it talks about personal data. So what is personal data? It's any data whatsoever that the person gives you that's about them, whether it's directly or, ad or indirectly identifiable. So things like drivers, you know, your car registration plate, it doesn't directly identify you, but it's so easy to go onto a, a website now to find out the owner of that car, that registration. So anything that can identify you as a person falls into the realms of what we now have got a legal obligation to protect you. And then we move on to the data processing boxes. Now, often people say to me, what does data processing mean? To be honest, if somebody's given you their data, anything you do with it is data processing, literally anything you do. But Andy, we don't do anything with data because we just store it. That is processing. Anything you do with people's data once we've given it to you means that you are processing data. So processing of data within the lingo definitions means that you become a data processor. So in the context of this, this diagram here, if a data subject is an employee of a company, they give that company their data. The data controller is the company. The company then processes that data. So they are the data processor. So you, in most cases, an organization will be both. Now, for an employee, if you store your data through a cloud platform or a platform where the records are stored, not by you and your company, but actually you put them on a, a cloud or software platform to make it easier for staff to you are then using what are called subprocessors. So these are suppliers to help you process and use people's data. And it's quite common. There's so many cloud platforms that will be sub processes. It's Microsoft platforms, it's SharePoint, it's, it's your G Suite products, all of those you are storing or keeping people's information as well as you might use lawyers, you might use um, um, HR agencies or consultants to help you. All of that falls into the bracket of processing data. But if it's not you doing it and you're relying on a third party, then they are a sub processor. So, so, so this is a really good diagram to help describe what happens here. Ultimately, we have an obligation under GDPR with those seven principles to meet a data subject. So they've given us their data. It's not ours. We take it in trust. So we've got that legal obligation. And anything that happens on the right hand side of this diagram, whether it's a processor, you as the processor or use third parties, you have to make sure that that meets and ticks all of those boxes all the way through. And, and as I said, and quite often businesses fail in their obligations because if you're using a supplier, well, of course it's going to be okay because they're GDPR compliant. But if you're the data controller, you're the one that stands up and has got the obligation to the data controller. So you have to make sure they're doing what they should be doing and what they're allowed to do. And more importantly, what, what we've told somebody we're going to do with their data. Because you step outside of that, then this all comes down and you get the, the non-compliance and we're, we're not meeting the legal requirements to go with it. So, I think that's so if I put that into real terms, if I put that into real terms, so Anna, for example, is an employee. Anna, therefore, is a data subject. Anna's passed me as the data controller some information. We'll come on to why Anna's passing me that information. Name, address, bank account details, for example. Um, I'm the data controller. I'm going to pass that to my accountant who runs a payroll system because Anna, funnily enough, wants to be paid. Funny that. Um, so my accountant actually is a data processor, and then we use a little bit of software. So we use Zero, for example, and Zero is a subprocessor. It's a nice example of a data flow, isn't it? And I know that when we go and talk to customers, we quite frequently do this data flow, don't we? Understand what the relationship is at every step of the journey. Yeah, and, it, and that's so, part of it. You, you can identify what happens when the data hits you to where it then goes beyond, and then you can evidence that through your records. You're 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 meeting the GDPR seven principles and the compliance that goes with it. Brilliant. So, uh, as I said before, if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them into the box. Let's challenge Anna and Andy on their knowledge of the GDPR. So, we've also got a few lawful bases for processing as well, which I know we have lots of fun with. Andy, do you want to go through these and just explain a little bit what detail these are? Yeah, so Anna mentioned, in one, principle one, we process data fairly lawfully in a transparent manner. These are the lawful reasons in which you can process data. GDPR defines six legal bases to we can use data, and it's down for us as an organization to make sure that we've noted what they are 
and more importantly, we stand by that. So at the, on the far left, you've got consent. Quite obvious, if somebody gives their consent to process data, we are asking that permission and therefore they're going to say yes or no. If they say no, we cannot use their data. So it's this, and most people, a lot of people have got this misconception around, you must have my consent to process data. No, we don't always need your consent to process data. Because if you take the example that we use there about an employee, if I'm an employee and I say to Anna, please can I have your data for processing? And she says, no, I can't employ you. I can't pay you and I can't do it. So consent really doesn't work because a yes or, it is that black and white, it's yes or no. So consent is one of the legal bases, but it tends to be one that, it sits nest and it, well, it may sit behind some of the others. So you've got contract through to legitimate interest, as you can see. Now, for a member staff that comes and works for an organisation, in most cases, they're going to work for you under an employment of contract. Within that employment of contract, you'll say what you do with the data, how we process. So therefore, everything we do with our data lawfully will be determined by that contract. And this will be the same with any service provision. So I always like to use the example of a pizza delivery company. If you want, and I'm a pizza delivery company, you want a pizza from me, there's certain information that I need from you in order to give you your pizza. So it's one of those that um, I'm going to need your home address, I need to know what you want, I'm going to want payment. Unless you give me that detail, I can't give you your pizza. Now, if I say to you, are you happy to give me this data? And you say, no, guess what? You're not going to get your pizza. So, <laughs> so if you come back to the principle of the contract, which is a strong word, is also performance a task or fulfillment of a task. So any data you need that's absolutely necessary to deliver what you need, we do under contract. When you take data, like for an employee, then there's going to be areas where you need to report or use their data because there's a legal obligation. So with payroll, we've got to report it to the HMRC, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore we process data because there's a legal obligation. Therefore we've got a legal requirement to do it. Um, vital interest is around, if we're an employer, that we want to make sure we're doing right by our employees. So therefore, if one of our members of staff suddenly keel over and clearly need medical attention, I'm not going to be trying to say to them, Anna, Anna, are you okay? Are you right if I share your details with the ambulance services? Because no, well, again, GDPR allows us to get ambulance support or doctor support, and we do that under what's called a vital interest. We're not asking for her permission, we're doing it because it's in her interest to do that. The public task is around, again, there's going to be certain instances where it's inappropriate to get someone's consent to process data because we're not always going to get it. So if we can see someone's committing a crime, I'm not going to get permission of the criminal for, for the data to, to report their details. But you bet your bottom dollar, I want to tell the police about that. And why is that? Because it's in the public interest that we're shouting around so this, this person's doing something they shouldn't be. And again, GDPR allows us to do that without getting that yes, no consent. And the last one's always an interesting one because it's the one that gives you a bit of flexibility, often used around in marketing context, that if you're doing something to somebody and using that data because it's of interest to them and it's also of interest to you as an organisation, then GDPR allows that under what's called a legitimate interest. It comes back to there's some caveats around making sure people are aware we're doing that. But typically, so if I use that piece, for example, if, if you've given me your details, I'm, I'm pretty confident you like pizza because you bought pizza from me before. So therefore, I can use a legitimate interest, providing I've told you to promote the fact we're doing, hey, we're doing a special two for one offer. Would you be interested? GDPR would allow me to do that kind of thing. So you've got six legal reasons there, and it, you have to think carefully around what you can and can't do. So from contract through to legitimate interest, we are saying that these are legally permitted uses of data without asking for consent. You're getting, you know, it's acknowledged, it's agreed that you're doing it, but you're not asking them for the yes or no. If we can't rely on one of those five, then you must get somebody's consent. So quite clearly you have to get consent. And within GDPR, there's certain areas of personal data, such as the sensitive special category data, things like sexual, where we must get consent to process their data as well. So it's always, it's always good fun running through these because people say, you know, with all of the stuff through COVID around medical testing, well, actually you start scratching your head. What's our legal reason for doing this? Because we've got to determine that before we start doing it. So. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's the important thing, isn't it, Andy? You just, you just put the nail on the head there. It's before we start doing anything and not after or during us doing things. We have to do it before. So, Anna, I know rights to the data subject is one of your favourite topics, and I know you're spending a lot of time in one of them in particular at the moment. Do you want to have a quick hurdle through what our eight data subject rights are? 
I'd love to. I love this topic. I, you know, Helen, you said earlier that we're all a bit geeky about it. This is one of my special areas of geekiness. So um, one of the things that we haven't mentioned in this session yet so far, um, and, and it's hinted there in, in, in the sentence, the rights of the data subject, um, the data privacy laws actually fundamentally were born from the uh, from our from the human law, human rights legislation. So Article 8 of the, the European uh, Human Rights Convention talks about the right to a private life. And that's that's, you know, kind of where the, the data privacy laws have come from. So we all have rights. Um, and, and these are the, the eight very specific rights that we can actually service if, if we want to know a little bit more about how our data is treated or we want to have a, a level of control about how organisations treat our data. So the first right that we all have is the right to be informed. So we've got if we want a pizza, Andy, I'm going to try I'm going to try here and use your pizza analogy. This is going to be a heck of a challenge, but I'll try. Um, so if we want to be informed about how the pizza company is using our data, um, then, um, you know, we would generally go, I would, well, I would advise you to go to their website, go all the way down to the bottom and look at their privacy policy. Because if you remember back to when I talked about um, the principles, I talked about the, the principle of transparency and most organisations achieve that mainly through the use of their privacy policy. So this is where you start to see the, the, the principles and the data rights starting to melt together a little bit. So we have the right to be informed. Um, if we've not been informed, then we absolutely can go to the organisation, go to the pizza shop and say, you, well, hang on a minute. You've not told me how you're going to use my data to provide my pizza. I'm not sure whether you'd want to do that because you might not get your pizza. Anyway, um, the second right that we all have is something called the right of access, which is the right to have a copy of the data that is being processed about us by an organisation. Um, and um, this is this is quite an interesting one because um, uh, you only this is this is often very misunderstood. Um, I see a lot of these kind of subject access requests, as they're called, coming in generally in a HR environment. Let me be honest, most people don't put a subject access request in when they're happy. It's generally because there's some kind of conflict going on and they want to people want to know what's been said. Um, and one of the com common misconceptions I see um, is that, you know, if somebody asks for a, a subject access request, they'll get everything and understand who said what about them. A subject access request only gives you the right to your personal data. So um, it, it means that um, anyone else's personal data is very likely to be redacted. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a very, very important tool and a very useful tool. I've used it myself to to, to find out and resolve um, issues, you know, with, with, with a couple of organisations. So really, really powerful tool. Um, the right to rectification. This means and, and relate this back again to the principles. We have the principle of accuracy. Um, that means reflected in our data rights is the right to have our data rectified if it's not correct. Um, so, you know, putting putting your company hat on here for a second, if you're not keeping the data correct um, and the, the individual finds out about that, they have the right to, to ask that to be rectified and, and you must do that. Um, we also have the right to erasure now. And don't start singing songs, anybody. We don't want any erasure songs right now. Um, uh, the, the right to erasure is, is, I would say it's not an absolute right. So you can ha you have the right to ask. But you don't. The organisation doesn't necessarily have to delete that data. It all depends on the lawful purpose for which they were keeping it. So if they were keeping that, if they were processing that data because they had a legal obligation to do it, then um, of course they, they they shouldn't be deleting it. So a lot of it comes back to making sure that you've got that lawful purpose right in the first place and that you understand that. Um, if the data has been collected because somebody's consented, then you would potentially look to have to delete that. Then so we do have that right to to erasure. Now, those rights were um, have been around for a long time. They're not they weren't just brought in with GDPR. They, they were they were around pre, pre GDPR. There was a new one that was brought in with GDPR, though, which is this next one, the right to data portability. And this is I mean, I, I don't know about you, you and uh, uh, Andy and Helen, whether you're seeing any of uh, any data portability rest, requests. I'm not necessarily seeing a lot of these being used at the moment. This is where you, um, a, 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 an individual has given consent for their data to be processed um, and um, they want to move services and they want to take that data somewhere else. They have the right to ask for that data, the data that they gave you to be ported over to the new, uh, the new service. Now that doesn't necessarily need to be, let's say doctors to doctors, 
it could be you know they want to move you know take some data from um uh you know they've given it to a school or something like that and they want to they, they want to port that data to a solicitors something like that so it, it's quite an interesting one that i don't see yet being used very often i don't know about you H helen and andy whether you've seen it being used very much no i, I always use the example because because obviously with smart meters now with our home person you know whenever you change power provider it was always yeah. a case that you'd go to the new power provider and they'd start billing you on estimated and you'd find you're paying more money than you need to so your smart meter should be able to record accurately you should be able to try you should be able to ask for that to be transferred and that i, I guess that's it but again i i've not changed it myself so it's not something <laughs> i've used but yeah. it, it, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? But, but like you say, Andy, you know, there are a lot of industries now that are already doing this, you know, as a matter of course. So when you do change doctors, your data goes with you. When you do change energy providers, your data goes with you. So there's already, it's already built into a lot of um, industry processes anyway, but it's still an important one to talk about. The next one we have is um, uh, the ability to restrict processing. Now, what does that mean? That means that you might be really unhappy with um, something that an organisation is doing but you want to temporarily ask them to stop doing it. Um, and I'm gonna get, Andy, I'm gonna have to go away from the pizza scenario here. I don't think I can fit it into the pizza scenario. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use the, I'm gonna use the, you used energy, so I'm gonna go with energy. Um, you may well have had a really big bill from your energy provider, and that's a bit timely this actually, isn't it? Um, we're all getting big bills from our energy providers, but we might want to know a little bit more about what that means and, and how that's been calculated. So we've, you know, I put in a, you know, I, I will put in a subject to ask a request to the energy provider and say, please give me a copy of all my data. Now, the reason I'm asking that potentially is because there might be a very large debt and I want to understand why that debt is there. And I might be being chased by a debt collector. Um, now that debt collector is, is starting to get a little bit pushy. And I might want to say, whoa, hang on a minute. I want to understand what's going on with my data to understand why that debt is there in the first place. So I have absolutely the right to ask for a restriction of processing on the um, debt collection side whilst the subject access request is being processed and I get a copy of that data. Now, um, once I've got a copy of that data, I might then say, hang on a minute, you've made a mistake and I might ask for a rectification. At this point in time, the restriction is still there and, and making sure that the debt collection, you know, debt collection process has, has been um, halted for now. You know, it's temporary. It's not it's not a it's not a stop and don't start again. It's it's a temporary hold. Um, and then once that's all been resolved, we can lift the restriction. So restriction is time bound. Um, you know, it, it, it can't you can't restrict it forever. And just going back to the erasure. Also, what you can't do is say, please, d please erase my debt. It doesn't work like that. Um, so I, I've seen that done a few times. So, you know, the, and that's why it's important that the erasure is not a not a, an absolute right. A lot of it depends on why the data was there in the first place. So restriction is, is, is actually a very, very useful right that we all have and one that can be used in scenarios where, you know, we feel that things are a little bit out of control and we just want a couple of things to stop and slow down. Stop, please, you know, temporarily put a, a, a stop on what we're doing what you're doing with my data so I can understand it a little bit more, but it is time bound. Um, then we have an objection to automated decision. What on earth does that mean? And we're on the graveyard shift. So what, what's going on there? Um, automated decision is where we might have applied for a credit card online, put in our details da, 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 and we get that nice little whirly wheel that says, you know, I'm thinking about it. And then computer says no. Um, and we've got the right to ask for that um, to be reviewed by a human. So we've got a right to object and go, I'm not happy with that decision, please have that re reviewed by a human. And then we've also got the right to object to the use of our data. This is often around the use of marketing. We've got the right to say, I object, please stop doing that. Wow, there's a whistle stop tour. So we've had a question come in as well, Anna, and uh, can you ever say no to a data rights request? Interesting, great question. Um, yes, you potentially can. Um, there are times um, that where you can, um, depending on the scenario. So let me give you a scenario here. We might, it might be a subject to request that's been done in a, um, a, a HR scenario where there's an investigation going on and maybe um, somebody has, has lost their job. Um, they then um, start, th there's a very unhappy parting of the ways. 
then we might start to see, you know, a little bit of, you know, accusations being thrown at the organization to say, well, yada, 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 you know, all sorts of things that could go on. If that person is behaving unreasonably um, and making things like unfounded accusations, um, there is the ability to actually say, well, do you know what? You do not necessarily, we don't think that you want to, you genuinely want access to your personal data. You are potentially using this as a, as a, um, as, as a, as a tool to be mischievous against the organization um and if you if that is the case you must have evidence i will say that you've got to have some really good evidence to demonstrate that that is the case but yes you can refuse those requests there's a couple of things that you would have to do um you still have to respond to it and you still have to tell them that you're uh refusing it you have to tell them why as well so but yes you can, you can refuse. Brilliant. that was a whistle stop tour through the uh, sorry andy i didn't mean to interrupt you carry on andy and I say everything's about transparency. I mean, exactly what you're saying there, and is if we're going to do this, or we always have to tell people why we're doing it, what we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the more open you can be with people, the less objections and problems you tend to have. You find the issues come from when you've done something you shouldn't have done, or you've hidden something, and yeah, and then it unravels. So. So I'm just really quickly going to say, Anna, do you want to quickly go through this one? Because I'm very conscious we are out of time. Thank you very much for everybody to stay on. We've had a couple of questions come through as well. Where to start? Because this this can be a little bit of a, oh, where do I go first of all, isn't it? It is. And, and one of the things, you know, how do we eat an elephant? This is my analogy. How do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. The GDPR can feel like a really, really big elephant. So the first thing we would always suggest is, Look at the data that you have. What data have I got? You know, ask yourself that question. What data have I got? And then once you've kind of, you know, built that picture of what data it has, and you could just be, it just could literally be a list of systems, uh, you know, initially. What data have you got? Then think about why you've got it. What is the reason? You know, and link it back to those purposes. You know, have I got it because I've got a legal obligation to have it? That kind of thing. Think about where it is. Where is it? Where have I put it? Is it in a cabinet? Is it in a computer? Is it in my computer? Is it in the cloud? Top tip. If it's in the cloud, it's only in someone else's computer. It's one of those things that sounds quite simple, but it's really it's really important to know when you're putting that data into the cloud, it's not just floating out around there. It's actually on someone else's computer. So real, remember when you've put it on someone else's computer. Is it safe? Who's got access to it? Make sure that those data processors those suppliers that you're using to process that data are keeping it safe. Um, think about how long you keep it, that retention, you know, there are lots and and, and then conscious there's always questions about, but how long should I keep it? And, and a lot of that is governed by lots of different laws. So there's lots of different laws out there that might say, well, you should keep, you know, certain health and safety data for 45 years. So, you know, let's make sure that you understand the why you've got it, because if it's, if there's laws that are telling you to have that data, then that law is likely to tell you how long to, to keep it as well. So think about how long you're keeping it. And if you're not sure, be honest about it, because those are the ones that you might have to prioritize and think about, mm, okay, do I need to look at that and look at whether I need to erase it? And think about who you share it with. Data sharing is really, really important. And it happens so much without us even thinking about it. So make a list of who you're sharing it with. Lots more I could say about that, Helen, but I'm so conscious of time. I know, I know. We are so short of time, aren't we? And I know you two can talk about this forever. So any questions? And Andy, any other thoughts, hints and tips that you would throw into the mix as well? Because this is still a very evolving piece of legislation, isn't it? We, we think back, as you rightly say, Anna, to 2018, I, but four years on. It's one of those is that I think a lot of people see this as it's, we've done it, thanks, very much finished. We may have done it in 2018. We may have, Things is, but things change all the time and I think GDPR itself is evolving but actually what you do with people's data is changing all the time so it's one of those you've always got to keep reflecting and thinking back so it's a case of where do you start it's actually where do you where do you keep on going because because what you did yesterday if you're not doing that today then you've got some GDPR aspects that need to be considered with it um, and I said just reflect on everything's been said there around genuinely if, you, if you've got a pizza with an elephant topping which I've just read somewhere else you might need some help so it's always good to rely on people that do this day in and day out because it helps it helps you to know what you're doing with some reassurances and often the answers are quite straightforward but you get yourself sort of tied up in knots and people say things and they're confused so there's, there's lots of guidance and, and people out there that can help you. 
Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Andy. As I said to everybody, this is the, this this session is being recorded. It will be available on the website uh, certainly by the beginning of next week. Uh, look out for future webinars. I'm sure I can bring Anna and Andy back, possibly to talk about things like I don't know retention, data reform bills, international data transfers. There, this we can talk for quite long periods of time on this topic, can't we? Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.